I'm posting this from a masked IP address at a public location. I don't want to be traced for reasons you'll soon understand. I won't give my name, and I won't give my alias. It's too easily recognized in certain circles. I don't want this making its way back to my doorstep in any way, shape, or form. You can call me X. Generic, I know, but that's the point. I was a contract killer. One of the best guns for hire on the East Coast. I had the clientele to prove it. Greedy skimmers, stonewalling employers, blackmailers, rats, moles, kingpins, even cheating husbands. I've done it all, and at a high price. My customers were more than willing to pay for a job done right. I was professional and precise, methodical, no names, no personal information. No face-to-face -face contact. No wire transfers. Cash. Only. Anonymity. Plausible deniability. And no personal involvement. These practices kept me alive and in business. And they were the reason my name is in such high demand. I got the call six months ago that started all of this. I handled it the same as all the others. This is the transcript. I keep an encrypted database with the kill switch protocol. You never know when the info could save your skin. Now it just serves to remind me of my mistake. Tony's Greek Diner and Deli. Take out or delivery. Delivery. Please. House or apartment. <coughs> Public. Um. Parsons Place, that's it. Hello? Location? Yes. Um, am I speaking to Miss... Listen, my name is... No names. Location? Hotel. Tenth floor. Room... Tomorrow night. 8.30pm. Description? He's next minister from say... Communicated for physical description. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, okay. He's about six feet tall, mid fifties, thinning grey hair, slightly overweight, and walks with a bit of a limp. He wears glasses, has a scar over his left eye. He twenty thousand dollars in unmarked fifties at the drop point. Four hours. Your contact knows the place. Be discreet. Don't be late. Understood. Listen, this is important. You have to know. Leave special instructions with the drop. I can't stand chatty people. They're bad for business. I don't want to know you, and you don't want to know me. Some people seem to have a hard time grasping this concept. Jesus, I shouldn't have even taken the call. When she fumbled on the password, I should have just cut the line. I wouldn't be in this mess if I had just cut the goddamned line. I could say hindsight is twenty twenty. I could blame the whole thing on the questionable and the unknowable. But I can't say I wasn't warned. I just didn't listen. Didn't care to know more than the necessary to the task at hand. When I collected the payment, I found more than the usual neatly stacked banknotes in the briefcase. I showed up at my contact's place of business that night, whose name I also choose to withhold. After hours in a safe room below his hardware shop, where the real money was made, shading dealings by the light of a low-hanging lamp, you'd be surprised how many people need a squeaky clean middle man who can keep his mouth shut. And I was one of his most loyal business partners. He slid the package across the desk toward me, a slightly stained gym bag lumpy with its contents. No marks for class or professionalism, but I'm sure it didn't attract any undue attention. I haven't to give it that much. The condition of the bag did not belie the crispness of the currency either, ruffled and frayed from who knows how many tumbles and turns. Beneath it all, I felt something heavier and more rigid. 
I dug around and pulled out a small book bound in something that looked like leather and felt like stone. A dusty thing with pages yellowing at the edges and blackening at the corners. I held it up to the light, confused. The hell is this? I asked. He sat back and lit up a cigarette. Hell if I know, he huffed. But I think you need to be a little more careful with the jobs you take. The chick was a whack job, and a real liability. He paused for a long drag on his cancer stick. Not worth the paycheck, if you ask me. No disrespect, mind you. I just hope this doesn't come back to bite you in the ass. I listened with one ear as I thumbed over the book. It was full of crude drawings, symbols, and a lot of it was written in a language I didn't recognize. A letter fell from beneath the front cover as I fanned through the pages. Enclosed in fine stationery, and sealed with wax like something out of the 18th century. I broke the seal and unfolded the note written in some kind of thick parchment. It read, Miss, we sincerely apologize for involving you in this grim affair, but we have tracked Father too long and too far to fail now. We require an artful hand and a certainty that only you can afford us. That man's intentions are a profound betrayal and a dire sin, and his death matters more than your life or mine. There is a world in the shadow of our own, a world of those who would do us harm, who seek a dark eternity for us all. He would loose them upon us. Please know that yours is a vital task, and that a much grander fate rests in your hands. No matter the outcome, we humbly thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Go with God, and may your reign be true. With admiration. This is some cold shit, man. I almost laughed. Is she serious? People don't leave mass massive bags of cash lying around when they're joking, he replied with a shrug. Shaking my head. I tossed the cryptic items aside and got back to business. I gave the cash my usual once over, a quick flip through the checking of for serial numbers and signs of counterfeit, then tossed him a small stack of large bills for his trouble. We had a ludicrous arrangement for several years, and I, he, and I know he wouldn't jeopardize this loss of my business, let alone his life, over such a petty sum. With a mildly annoyed tip of the hat, I took my leave to make preparations. I almost made it to the front door before he tried to sell me on a new line of garden shovels he had gotten in stock that morning. You know, in case I found myself in need of a quick disposal. He knew that wasn't part of my job or my problem, but it never stopped him from trying to make an extra buck at my expense. In fact, his sales pitches had become a routine part of my visits, as had my refusals. I decided to make my post at a nondescript office building two blocks from the hotel, one of several I had identified and favored for their easy roof access and lazy, contracted security. I showed up at half an hour early, enough time to set up shop and account for the typical human lack of punctuality. The sun had already nearly set, and the cover of the night was a boon of which I had always took full advantage, given the opportunity. I walked through the door in a grey, mild suit and tie, slight five o'clock shadow, false mustache, and a salt and pepper wig and the visage of a middle-aged, constipated stiff opting for a late night at an office to avoid sharing a bed with his hag of a wife. My medium-sized briefcase didn't so much as raise an eyebrow as I approached the guard at the front desk. I passed him the doctored security pass I had lifted off a careless employer earlier that day. I also took time to make small talk. Some bullshit about being transferred for the week on a joint venture project and hating the hours. I find that friendly conversation usually instills more trust than a badge. I made my way straight to the roof, 
prepared to cover the security cameras, which, of course, there were none. I found no use for my pick-locking set with the unlocked door. I stepped through and found a good corner spot with no safety railing and a clear view of the hotel's west wing. The landlord was just begging for a lawsuit when some idiot wandered up for the scenery and took a fall, but that carelessness was exactly why I chose the place. I opened the briefcase and polished the lashes and pulled the parts from their back foam inserts one at a time. Folding the thumb hole stock clicked lightly into the upper assembly. I fitted the lower receiver and trigger housing to the forward grip. I slid the scope onto the mod rail and tightened the clamps. I screwed it in and secured the barrel, then ported the sound suppression jacket. I slid the bolts onto the upper assembly. I paused for a long moment and considered what I was doing. The note in the book had scarcely left my mind since the night before, and the more I thought about it, the more I chastised myself for taking such a stupid job. A lot of what I did relied on the confidentiality of the people who had the common sense to keep our business to themselves. My contact was right. The chick was clearly out of her mind, and I was taking a huge risk by involving myself in their affairs at an anonymous level. I mean, was I really about to dip the holy man over some delusional fantasy of spiritual warfare? Did this man really have to die out of fear he may summon some kind of demon? I knew better than to let any moral conflict bother me. I knew this was just a job, but this was ridiculous. Did I really want to get involved with these nut jobs? The hell had I gotten myself into? I guess it wasn't my place to judge. Sure. There may have been better reasons to end a life, but I was just a hired hand. A car washer doesn't question a man who brings in a clean ride for detail, right? A pharmacist doesn't question a thin woman buying weight loss supplements. Besides, I never backed out of a job before, and I didn't plan to start. If my reputation was going to take a hit one way or the other, I might as well make good on my end of the deal. I checked the feed mechanism and loaded the magazine. Six rounds, 30, 308 caliber, modified range. I focused the lens and scoped my range. I closed and locked the bolt, and the round was loaded. The recoil pad sat firmly against my shoulder, and the weight of the rifle balanced on the bipod. I rested my thumb over the safety, and took a deep breath, and waited. As I stared through the scope in the room, the last rays of sunlight provided just enough clarity to make out a few important details. Clearly, the guy had occupied the room for some time, and he had been busy. Just about every inch of the walls had been covered in the same gibberish from that book, written in what looked like permanent marker. He had torn up carpeting and covered the floors in all a manner of pentagrams and other circular symbols. At the center of each sat a variety of objects, including candles, piles of plant and rocks, and bowls filled with a number of different liquids. Last, but certainly not least, was the bed. It had been stripped down to the mattress, which had been painted over with the last incredibly intricate pentagram and thick iron chains and shackles trailed from the bedposts. Sick bastard. The scene was almost cartoonish, really. The kind of thing you'd expect to see in a bad horror film, or a haunted house. I wasn't keen on the idea of harming the mentally ill, but I figured he'd be better off if I put him out of his misery. Before I had much time to admire his work, my mark stepped through the door, lighting enough candles on his way t in to give the entire room a flickering orange glow. He looked neurotic, fidgety and sweaty, and he constantly darted his gaze over his shoulder. I had a clear shot, and I should have just taken it, but I was struck with morbid curiosity. So, I followed his movements about the room, the crosshairs constantly hovering over his eye. 
I watched his deranged ritual unfold. Watched as he fretted over the minute placement of the random items around him. Watched as he rubbed his hands together and gnashed his teeth in nervous anticipation. I watched as he muttered prayers into the open air from a book that looked much like mine. And watched as the laughable practice of a mad obsession turned to true horror. As the ritual pressed on, I began to feel the going hons in that room for myself. And I mean that in the most literal sense. Something had gripped me. Something otherworldly. And the scope of my rifle became a portal of forced witness to the blasphemous and obscene. The cool breeze around me turned to the musty heat of candles and sweat. The scent of a gritty urban summer turned to the stench of his labors and filth about the room and the sounds of roaring traffic below turned to his muffled mutterings and the banging struggle of someone or something behind the bathroom door. So at a great distance, and through the crosshairs still marched over his eye, I was suddenly there. I watched as he dragged the source of the noise from the bathroom, heard his grunts of his, in his victim's muffled cries through the duct tape over her mouth as he dragged her to the bed, and heard the rattling of the shackles as he unbound her limbs one by one, only to restrain them once again. She lay splayed out across the mattress, downing a wrinkled, stained nightgown, likely the nightwear in which she was abducted. She was to be some unseen something sacrificial meal, and the candle flames wafted and dimmed in the growing breeze of its hunger. My vigil's hold released me, but only for a moment, long enough to feel my index finger slightly caress the curve of the trigger, long enough to slow my hastened breath. I watched him press his hand against his mouth and pace about the room as he considered the next gruesome step. I could hear the anxious skittering and shuffling of the demons now, seeming to come from the very shadows in the walls, and many shrill voices chattered pleas for their feast. They grew irritated with his hesitation. I saw the terror in his victim's eyes as she caught the sheen of the blade drawn from his belt, a brutal dagger with a serrated edge, and she struggled against her own shackles until her skin began to tear and bleed. I watched him approach her slowly with a look of sorrow and remorse upon his face, apparently an unwilling prisoner in this deed. My finger gently pressed the trigger as I watched him raise it over his head, poised it for a downward thrust. The creatures in the shadows hissed and moaned their approval. He stayed his hand for several moments, as did I, until the resolve crumbled. He stumbled back and dropped the knife, and he covered his face in tears of personal disgust. The creatures from the shadows wailed and shrieked with fury, and the room began to quake around him shaking cabinet doors open and tossing aside objects about the floor. The candles flared and raged. My panic released my mind, hurtling back to my own body, and adrenaline cur coursed through my veins. The sound suppression jacket made a harsh thumb for the gunshot, and the left side of the priest's face shattered into a cloud of red mist as he fell limp and went crashing to the floor. Just as his head made contact with the hard wood, the candles extinguished in unison with one violent flicker, and silence and darkness befell the room. I cycled the bolt, and the jiggling of the bullet casing against the cement became the only sound I could hear for miles. I kept watch through the scope, and a thin beam of moonlight shone through the broken window to show the unbloodied half of his face. I stared into his unblinking eye for what seemed like hours, trying and failing to slow my heartbeat. Then it happened. Slowly, soundlessly, a hand like a long bundle of twigs crept from the shadows, wrapped its gnarled talons over his face, his eyes still visible between them, and dragged him into the darkness. Fuck this. I stuttered to myself, fuck this.
this, I disassembled the rifle as quickly as I could and returned it to the briefcase. I rushed down the stairs and headed for the back entrance, stashed the rifle in a disguised hidden apart compartment beneath my back car's back seat, and peeled out of the parking lot into the busy traffic. I would be leaving the city, disposing of the disguise, the badge, and the bullet casing, and never looking back. Less than a week later, I read about the priests in the papers. Their description of the crime scene erased any doubts I might have had about the reality of that night. They said that they found his body gnawed into the bone. They said that the damage was so severe that they had to identify him by dental records. And the gunshot wound was far from the focus of the story. Strangely, they also mentioned nothing about the ritualistic scene or state of the room. The girl, apart from slight bruising and a state of shock, apparently had been left untouched. I thought I'd be safe if I could just run far enough away, but fleeing did me no good. I pulled quite a few jobs since that night, all across the country, never inclined to stay in one place for too long, and all of my marks shared the same fate. I poisoned a slumlord in New Jersey, and I heard about his vicious modeling from the evening news the following night. I slid a knife between the ribs of a heavy-handed bookie in Northern California a month later, and I watched the hands claw him from my grip and into the shadows before he even took his last breath. I heard him devour um, mafioso's ex-wife in her own bedroom. I can still remember the smell that followed. You see, I kept that book, and I've tried many times to make sense of what happened of that night. I don't understand much. I don't know what they are or what they want, but I've come across a damning revolution. Apparently, apart from the summoning, the ritual was just a formality. These things only require a mortal, any mortal, to take the life of another in their presence. They feed not on the dead, but on the murdered. And once fed, they follow the hand that fed them, demanding sacrifice again and again until the killer's life is done. The priests had defied them, and they were not pleased. I, however, did not and they collected their meal from my hand. He invoked their wrath, and I don't know what would have become of him if I had not pulled the trigger. However, his death was my first act of unwitting service, and now I don't know what will become of me if I stop. But I just can't send anyone else to that horrible fate. Until recently, I only killed for money. I justified my actions with the blandity of evil. The idea that such a thing had become an inherent state of normality in society. I profited from death, but so did coffin salesmen and life insurance agents. They would, people would kill one another with or without me. They'd murder each other for vengeance, petty theft, or even their own self-righteous brand of justice. What made me so different? There was no guilt in the ordinary. Now that I've witnessed true evil, I can't justify my lifestyle that way anymore. I've seen what horrible things prey on us in life and death. I've seen the dark forces that count on us to send each other to the grave, to do their work for them, and who hunger for us. I've seen what may wait in death, and I can no longer take a life so lightly. In living as I have, I wonder just how many I've damned. I wonder if I ended the priest's suffering, or only sent him to an even worse torment. I can feel them growing restless. They're angry, but I fed them for the last time, and I will no longer run. Whatever comes for me now, I can't help but feel deserving.
for all those lives I have ended, I can think of no other way to make amends. God forgive me. I am so sorry. I'm... I'm so very sorry. <laughs>